prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. Amen. Congregation, would you please stand if you'd open your hymnals to number 260. We'll be singing, And Can It Be That I Should Gain. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> I 
Good morning. morning. I welcome you all to our worship service this morning. And of course, a welcome to those of you that are joining us for worship here uh, right now through closed circuit cable television at the Elmcrest Manor. And a welcome to those of you that will be joining us for worship later through your various electronic devices. I have some announcements that I'd like to make. A reminder that Peace Church Heritage Dinner is coming up Sunday, March 27th, following our worship service. Flesh Kikla and Nefla soup will be provided. We're asking the congregation to bring a family favorite dish to share as well. Uh, Also, I received in the mail a notice from the McKenzie County Right to Life. They're having their third annual speech contest. That's for students grades 7 through 12. First prize, $1,500, second prize, $1,000, so on down to eighth place, $50. It says all eight places will also receive a trophy. Contestants must write a five to seven minute original persuasive pro-life speech. So if you're interested in that, I'll give you a copy of the flyer. It has more details uh, on that issue. Board of Christian Education meeting after worship service today. Also a reminder about our Lenten DVD program. The details are in your bulletin and we are still looking for people to sign up on the sign-up sheet in the atrium in the, on the bulletin board there about providing snacks for the session. Uh, CEF Spring Banquet, we've been uh, talking about that and having that as an announcement in the bulletin for a few weeks now. We had kind of wanted to know the information if possible by today, but I can extend it two or three days, and then I have to call in the, uh, the number that will be attending. So if you haven't gotten me, we yet, me yet to verify your attendance, please do so. A uh, youth group is having their lock-in here at the church on March 18th and 19th. That's all the announcements we have. I'm aware of one birthday, uh, but do we have other announcements first? If you have an announcement, just come to the microphone at this time. If not, I understand that Cassidy McMullen has a birthday. Do we have other birthdays today? None? Okay, we'll sing happy birthday to Cassidy then. For our pulpit humor, there was a little boy in kindergarten and suddenly he started crying his eyes out and so the teacher asked him what was wrong and he said, I can't find my boots. The teacher looked around the classroom and saw one pair of boots and she said, well, are these yours? No, they're not mine. The little boy shook his head sobbing. So the teacher and the boy, they searched all over the classroom for his boots. Finally, the teacher gave up and said, Are you sure that these boots are not yours? I'm sure, the little boy sobbed. Mine had snow on them. (laughs) Oh, dear. Well, at this time, if we would stand for our praise song, it's in our hymnal. Would you please open to number 251? We'll be singing in the cross of Christ, I glory. Please stand.
us remain standing and take a moment to meet and greet one another.
if you take your bulletin insert, you'll see there a listing of our prayer requests and our praises. I have some things by way of update. Um, Edgar Hazel has been in the hospital and uh, conducting tests and so on, and he has some heart-related issues that he is dealing with. Uh, also, uh, Richard Cole uh, is in the hospital, has some gallstones and pancreatitis, so uh, they'll be working on that. And um, as far as Megan Norton is concerned, you see there that she had her gallbladder surgery and they thought that was going to resolve the symptoms that she has and no. Unfortunately, they're not to the bottom of that yet. Uh, they've been to all kinds of doctors in different facilities. Um, they pretty much eliminated just about everything. They are now considering a thing called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. For those of you that know what that means, I didn't, I had to look it up in the medical dictionary that I keep in my office to keep up with all these things. So, uh, but yeah, and so they'll be doing some testing for that and hopefully uh, then they'll know kind of how to treat things. So she needs her prayers and concerns certainly as well. Um, Austin is with us and feeling better, but not 100%. So there he is. So very good, Austin. Glad to have you with us. And out of the hospital, I'm sure uh, those are not the most fun places to be. So uh, that's great. Uh, do we have any other requests, praises, anything of that sort? Austin, do you have something? This is not asking for brownie points or anything, but it's nice when the choir, you can't see everybody and count everybody up here, and they sounded excellent. Uh, just wanted to thank you for your prayers and your thoughts. Um, kind of explain, I guess, uh, they're not really sure what happened yet, but I wiped all of my platelets out the other day and ended up in the hospital for half of a week, but I built them back up after they wiped out my immune system. So uh, Monday morning I have more labs and more testing to have done and hopefully a one-time deal, but we will see. And I appreciate your prayers and thoughts through everything. Thank you. I just have a... Uh a thought for you this morning. Uh, it's a praise. Um, uh, Deb and I have been blessed to spend the last couple days with our grandchildren and uh, Hattie will be five in uh, April and she goes to Little Lamb's daycare in Mandan and uh, God bless uh, teachers and it's Sunday school teachers that that teach our little ones about Jesus. Um, she was sitting in the living, in the uh, kitchen the other day on the floor and um, she was playing daycare and uh, she started to recite the Lord's Prayer and she said, our Father which is working in heaven and when she got to the part where it says, thy will be done, she said, I will be done. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed at first, but the more I thought about that, I thought, how appropriate could that be? Because someday you and I will stand before Jesus and he will tell us good works. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And on that day, you and I will be done. Thank you. One other thing I'd want to make by way of request, the Seibel family has lost a grandmother, and so we want to lift that family up in prayer and extended family, of course. Any other requests before we go to Lord in prayer this morning? I oh, okay. <laughs> I just have a, um, a little thing to add to Sean being over in Poland. He was over there, and I... We weren't hearing anything, so I got a hold of him, and he's texted back that he was back in Germany due to a back injury. So he's back over in Germany and trying to get healed up. 
so he can go back over to Poland. So now pray for his back, please. Okay. Let us take a moment to speak to the Lord in the privacy of our hearts. That will be followed by a pastoral prayer. Then together we'll say the Lord's Prayer. Let's come to his throne of grace at this time. Father, you have heard the needs and concerns that are expressed this morning. We think of Sean and his back injury, and uh, we certainly want to pray and ask for his healing, but also his protection and the other folks that are serving in our military here and abroad, uh, those that are in that region, uh, especially in Poland. A lot of soldiers are sent there to help with the evacuation that's coming uh, into Poland and other countries. We lift up Edgar with his heart-related issues. We lift up Megan and we ask that they would hopefully have finally discovered what it is that she's been going through all this time and, and figure out the best way to treat it. We think of the Seibel family and extended family as their hearts are heavy and they have lost loved ones. We think of the other families too that are listed there in our bulletin. We lift them up to you as well. We think of Richard Cole, who has gallstones and pancreatitis, that they'll uh, make a decision quickly as to how to treat that and that he might be released to go home. Lord, for others that are dealing with other things, battling with cancer, some of them, it's not the first go round. For those that have MS, for those like Jacob that need a kidney transplant, we lift up John Broyles and his ongoing situation. We think of those with other heart-related issues. The list could go on and on as we think of others that even are not on our list, that are in our families, that are in our community. We lift them all up to you, and we ask your hand of healing. We also give you thanks and praise and congratulations. Dane came and, and shared those precious moments that we have with our children and our grandchildren, especially when they are young, and sometimes there is so much wisdom in the, in the things that they say. We give thanks for those who are new parents, and we ask that you would watch over the health of those young people, that they would someday accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, for those other things in our hearts and minds, you know what they are. We ask that you administer to them as well. We ask this all in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, we bring you these gifts this morning, not because you personally have a need for them, but because we have a need to bring them. They're reminders to us of your bountiful grace that you have showed to us in so many ways and your matchless love. And so now we offer our gifts to you with thanksgiving for all of our blessings. Amen.
Congregation, please rise for offertory response. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Turn with me, if you would, please, in your Bibles to John 17 and verse 17. That's our sermon text for today. And if you've been following along on your bulletin and your sermon outline, you realize that we're doing part two of the sermon uh, having to do with knowing God and having to do with truth. And as we get into part two of this, uh, I would remind you that in part one we talked about the fact that God's word is truth, that Jesus himself is the way and the truth and the life. And what that means for today, for part two, is that since we know that God's written word is true, that means it's trustworthy, it's reliable, it means that we can claim the promises that are in scripture. That's, if you will, the practical application of what we're going to talk about today. So what we're talking about is, what is it that we can claim? What is it that we can do because of the fact that God's word is truth? Follow along with me then, John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the what? Truth. Your word is truth. So there it tells us a couple of things immediately, that the process of being sanctified, the word sanctify in scripture means to make holy. Sanctification comes by the truth, after all. How can a person be, be right and sanctified if they're living based on something that isn't true? And then it says, what tells us what is true? Your word is true. So that brings us to part two then. We're gonna start looking at blessings, blessings. God's word is blessings. What is a blessing? I guess there's different ways to define it, but let's define it this way. When someone is in a spiritual authority, whether the father or the mother of the house or a grandparent or a pastor of church, speaks a blessing upon a person. It's a supernatural creative power of God to shape the destiny of a child's or some other person's life who is in the church. So there are some wonderful things there for us that we can take advantage of that have to do with blessings. And I want to just look quickly at some examples of, of this in scripture so you don't think that we're just making this up. Turn with me to Genesis chapter one and verse 28, page one of your Bible if you're reading from the blue Bible that is in the pew rack in front of you. Genesis 1 is gonna tell us something about uh, a type of blessing and where it comes from. Genesis 128, it says, God blessed them. God is the one acting, doing the blessing, and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, that tells us several things, but one of which is something that's going on in our American culture that I think is not a good thing. And that is, the Bible tells us right here in this passage and other passages that people are superior to animals. People are superior to animals. And you wouldn't know that based on some of these crazy laws we have in some of the states. So in other words, people are superior to the spotted owl. The neo-pagan, secular humanist, environmentalist have gotten laws passed that are ridiculous. Did you know that a man can be fined $50,000 in court and spend up to five years in jail for killing a golden eagle? 
Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should abuse our environment, not at all. But you can get that for killing an animal, but you can kill a human being and be home in six months in America in some cases. My friends, that is sick. That is sick. That's not what scripture teaches us. Scripture teaches us that humans are more valuable than animals. Another blessing, you don't have to turn to this, Genesis chapter 12, verses two and three. This is a blessing that God gives to Abraham. He says, I'll make you into a great nation. Wow, wouldn't you like to hear that with your name? I'm gonna make you into a great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, that meant several things, one of which is that the Jewish people are the nation through which all of us Gentiles, meaning non-Jews throughout history, have been blessed, if you follow the line and lineage of the birth of Jesus. What a great promise. Isaac blessed his son Jacob in Genesis chapter 27, and so on. We find other blessings in the Old Testament as well. Jesus blessed his disciples as he ascended into heaven. So if God can bless Adam and Eve and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jesus can bless people and Paul in the Gospels, or excuse me, in the New Testament talks about blessing people, it raised a question in our, my mind. None of us, I think, including myself, take enough advantage of this great promise. Why aren't we spending more time blessing people, whether that's verbally face to face, whether that's praying a blessing upon them in the name of Jesus, or however we would do it. There's a prayer that I like that I use in my prayer time when I ask God to bless somebody. I'll say, I ask God to bless this person or persons in the face of God and in the face of their fellow man. So, in other words, we're asking God, give that person favor with you and favor with their fellow man. Now, I admit there are times when we have to choose. There are some times when we have to choose to be blessed and favored by God, but not with our fellow man. But hey, why not ask for both options? That's the way I look at it. Probably don't do enough of that. We can ask for God's blessing for our prosperity. You may or may not get it. For your health, for your love, for your joy. Bless you in your relationships. Your going and your coming. Blessings in your schoolwork, in your marriage, in your business, whatever it is. There's absolutely no reason why we can't ask God for blessing. For ourselves, for others. Fourthly, God's word is healing. God's word is healing. Health is a gift from God. You know, it's wonderful, all this technology we have in healthcare. I'm all in favor of all of that, all of the diagnostic stuff, uh, people that God has given tremendous skill and brain power to, to, to be doctors and nurses and, and various other fields in healthcare uh, and diagnostic equipment and people uh, with, with steady hands to do surgeries and those kinds of things, it's wonderful. But ultimately, our life is in the hands of the Lord. Those folks are just instruments that God has chosen to use for our benefit. Our health ultimately comes from God. And, and we do a lot of things to try to stay healthy, don't we? And that's not bad. We join health clubs. You get $400 running suits, some people. <laughs> $100 shoes. You can't buy a really good pair of running shoes these days, I think, for under $100. At least I haven't seen them, for those that are serious runners anyway. And you get all the gears, and you take all the pills, and we try to stay young and healthy. But the greatest health aid is right here in the Word of God. It's life and health to your body. I'm going to share a couple of testimonies from Pastor John Hagee. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but anyway, these, these two testimonies, and I'm quoting from his, his experiences with prayer and healing. Here's what he says in the first. 
Let me give you a personal testimony of my mother. At the age of 69, she was diagnosed with colon cancer. When the doctor said, with surgery you may live another 12 months, you're going to come out of surgery with a colostomy, you're going to be in the hospital three weeks, you're going to have marginal health, and then you're going to die. He was brutal, but he was honest. We did what we always do as a family in a time of trouble. We fasted and we prayed. My mother read the word of God, the healing scriptures releasing the healing power of God into her body. We went into the surgical room like every family did, bearing grave faces and looking death eyeball to eyeball. We were told that the surgery would last four hours, and in an hour and a half, the surgeon came out smiling. He said, the tumor has mysteriously shrunk. What was the size of a cantaloupe is now the size of a plum. There is no colostomy, there are no roots. She went home, not in three weeks, but in three days. She went back to work in two weeks and retired at the age of 70, only because they made her retire. Today, she's 84 years of age and in great health. Why? Because the word of God is greater than cancer. Wow, that's pretty exciting when God chooses to work in that way. Here's a second testimony also from Pastor Hagee. My uncle, the Reverend Gerald Hagee of California, retired Assemblies of God preacher, had a heart attack and he recovered. Because he believed in the healing power released by the power of God, he made a tape of healing scriptures in the Bible, and we have that tape available for those across the country who'd like to have it. It's simply called the healing scriptures. He told his wife, if I have another heart attack, put this tape in with the healing scriptures in my ear and don't stop playing it, period. Several years later, he did have another major heart attack in his home in Oklahoma City. He was pronounced dead by the AMS attendant. He arrived at Mercy Hospital in Oklahoma City where the doctor who was married to my cousin was the chief of staff, Dr. Robertson. He told my aunt, Vivian, he's on life support, he's brain dead. If he lives, he's going to be an absolute vegetable, she said, so let's put the tape on him. They took the tape and put the earphones on his ear, and in a matter of hours, he began to respond on the screen, where there was nothing before but a straight line. Suddenly, there appeared a beep, beep, beep. In a few more hours, he became conscious, and then he began to sit up. In just a few days, he began to eat. Friend, when you get a Hagee eating, he's on his way to health and recovery. Then he went home out of that cardiovascular ward. Everyone in that cardiology ward wanted those tapes. Why? Because they knew there was life-giving power in the healing of the word of the living God. Item five, God's word is alive. Turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter four and verse 12. Hebrews 4.12, so that puts you at about page 847 and 848 if you're reading from that blue Bible in the pew rack in front of you. We all there? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is, what are the next three words? Hmm. A written word, living and active, that doesn't make sense. Oh, yes, it does. Just a minute. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So there it tells us some of the things that the Word of God does. But note that it says it's living and active. How can something that is written down on a piece of paper that's in a book be living and active? Doesn't make any sense, does it? Until you realize it's not the actual book itself, it's the God that's behind the words of the book that make it living and active, the Holy Spirit. That's how it makes sense. That's how the Holy Spirit can do those things that are in that verse and other things the Bible tells us. 
That's the reason why you can be reading your Bible verse one day and you say, oh, that's what it means. And then maybe a week later, a month later, even several years later, you're reading the same passage and you say, huh, I got an entirely different meaning out of it this time. It fits the context of what I'm dealing with in my life right now. Why? Because the living God through the Holy Spirit makes that word alive and active in your life, in your mind, in your heart, in your brain. It does what we call illumination. It reveals the message that God wants you to get out of that passage. So you can get different meanings out of it at different times. Now, you don't want to take it out of context, of course, either. That's always dangerous. But because God lives and breathes, he's a living God, and he makes the scripture a blessing on the times in life when we're carrying a burden. This book is alive. There is no other book, religious or otherwise, that can make that same claim. This is a book that will wrestle with us in the midnight hour. It's a book that will smite us. It's a book that will comfort us. It's a book that will smile upon us. It's a book that has warmed people's hearts. It's a book that will weep with you when you mourn. It's a book that will sing with you when you're happy. It's a book that will whisper to you. It's a book that will shout at you. It's a book that will bring clarity when you're confused. It's a compass for your soul. It lives. It's alive. Number six, God's word is protection. Protection from what? You know what it's protection from? That. The devil. Now, I don't think the devil actually has horns, but I know in cartoons and TV and comic strips and stuff, they always show the devil with horns, right? Even the Halloween costumes have horns. Well, I don't know anything about horns. The Bible doesn't say that the devil has horns, but the devil is a real spiritual being. The Bible says of him in 1 Peter 5, 8, that he's like a roaring lion that seeks to devour you. That's what he tries to do. He wants to devour you. Not literally eat you, but he wants to mess up your life in every way and in every area that he can. He wants to destroy you. Don't ever forget that. But the word of God is your protection against the wiles of the devil. You know, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, remember that when he started his earthly ministry, he went to the, to the desert to be tempted, and the devil gave him three main temptations. And each and every time, he quoted the word of God. That was his protection from the attacks of the devil. People try all kinds of things, like positive thinking. Well, that may have its place, but guess what? The devil is not afraid of positive thinking. The devil is afraid of the word of God, however. And there's other lots of idle, idle uh, psychobabble and psycho-cybernetic garbage that's out there today. It won't help you when the devil attacks. He will eat you like a Snickers bar. That's what he wants to do. But when you quote the word of God, you can stop him dead in his tracks. There's a pastor who told a story, allegedly a true story. He said this, in 1971, a madman invaded my church with a loaded gun. Well, we've seen that before in our recent culture history, don't we? He walked on the aisle to shoot me right in front of the congregation. He said, I'm a Satanist. I want you to beg for your life right in front of this congregation because I'm here to prove Satan's power. I responded with the word of God. I said, no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. That was pretty bold. He became angry. He said, I'm going to kill you on the count of three. He lied. He fired at the count of two. He started shooting and he emptied the gun from a distance of about eight feet and he missed with every shot. Hmm, should have gotten some training. The next day, the police put up a two by four and traced the bullets where he had been standing and the bullets were in the wall, three to the left and three to the right, 
And again, these are his, his words. As the very angels of heaven buried those bullets around my head, I am here today because the word of God is greater than the power and the principalities of darkness. There is power in the word of God. Item seven, God's word is authority. We have some authority that I think much like blessing, we, we probably don't use enough. We have the power to bind and to loose. The power to bind and to loose. Matthew 16, 19 says, and this is Jesus speaking, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples when he says this. Now, I want you to think about the fact that God has given us some authority that we either don't know about or we take for granted. But notice where the initiative comes from. The initiative rests from us. To bind and to loose, the initiative starts with us, not with God. What you bind on earth, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose will be loosed. You notice those little personal pronouns? You. You have to initiate the action in your life. It doesn't start when God acts. It starts when you act, when you're talking about the area of binding and loosing. A lot of people stand around or sit around and say, gee, I wonder when God's going to do something. Well, why don't you initiate some action for your own benefit, for the benefit of your family, for the benefit of your church, for the benefit of your community? community. The initiative rests with us. And Satan's object is to destroy you, destroy your marriage, destroy your health, destroy your finances, destroy your peace of mind, destroy your children. What do you think is going on in American culture today? It's all about destroying our kids. It's all about destroying the nuclear family. That's what's going on in America. But you bind the strong men, you tie them up with the word of God. And here's, let me give you some examples of the kinds of things that people have done in the past. Let's say that your business or your finances are under attack. Say something like, Satan, I'm speaking to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I bind you by the authority that has been given to me. And I confess the word that my God shall apply all of his needs, my needs according to his riches in glory. I confess that I have never seen a righteous person forsaken, and that he is the Lord that gives the power to wealth. These are, these are paraphrases of different scriptures found in different places. You don't need to win the lottery, although that'd be nice. What you need to win is the Lord of glory. What about when you're being attacked in your health? People have said something like this. I'm speaking to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I say to you that the powers and principalities you are bound. You are bound from operating against me and my family in any way. You are bound for operating against my wife and my children in any way. According to the word of God, I confess that by his stripes I am healed. Quote from the Old Testament. I shall live and not die. Jesus Christ is still the great physician. Physician. What about if you're controlled by fear? Are you living in a state of depression or resentment? Satan controlling your mind? He's an emotional killer. He wants to make a wreck. How do you handle that? You say, Satan, I'm speaking to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the conqueror of Calvary, the Lord of glory, who already defeated you on the cross. You and all those that demons that follow, you will be bound in the bottomless pit in eternal chains of damnation. You wretched, despicable lizard, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm saying to you, get rid of that spirit of fear, it's leaving me. That spirit of depression, leave me. That spirit of bitterness, go. That spirit of resentment, go. See, the Bible is a book of authority and power if we learn how to use it. The disciples in Jesus' day had the authority to cast out demons, authority to talk to God Almighty in Jesus' name. I think some of you know that uh, 
before we moved here, we were pastoring a church in northern Minnesota. And after we moved here, I got a call from one of the elders of the church, told me this story. He said that his, his daughter had some young children, and there had been a death. Uh, the young grandchild had died, came down with what they thought, thought was flu symptoms, didn't get better, took the child to the hospital. Child died, that's the short version. The young sister, who was obviously still living, was sitting in a room by herself playing and started to tell her mother about how her younger brother would come and play with her in the room. Well, at first, the mother just thought this is just a kid's story, the kid's grieving, misses her brother, et cetera, et cetera. This kept reoccurring. Finally, the boyfriend, who was a Marine, came to visit one day, didn't have any particular religious leanings, walked into the room and saw a little child sitting there with the daughter. So Tim called me and said, what do we do? I said, Tim, you've got to take authority. That's a demon. You've got to get rid of it. So we talked about what they had to do in the house. They did. They got the elders of the church together. They went room to room. They commanded those demons never to return, never to come in that property. Never had a problem since. Praise God. We have more power that we don't take advantage of. Sometimes just because we don't know we have the power and sometimes because we don't know quite how to use it. As I think about my own spiritual journey and my own life, there were times when I was just getting beat up spiritually and I didn't know how to handle it. So I had to go to more mature believers and say, hey, this is what's going on? What do I do about it? Claim the authority of Jesus. And then eighth, and this is the last item we're going to cover today, God's word tells the future. God's word tells the future. You don't need to go read a book on astrology. You don't need to get out a Ouija board. You don't need to go consult a palm reader who's just doing it for fun and money. You don't need to look into a crystal ball and go, um, or some foolish thing like that. What you need to do is read the word of God. Do you want to know what's going to happen in the future in the Middle East? Read the word of God. It's in there. You want to know when the Third World War is going to be fought and who's going to be in it? Read the word of God. Do you want to know what the armies, where they're going to come from, at least what geographical region, not by name? Read the Bible. Do you want to know what percentage of death is going to happen on the earth? It's in there. Do you want to know the financial future of the world? Do you want to know about worldwide global inflation that's going to lead to a national monetary collapse? It's in there. Now, folks, I get it. Most of this stuff I'm talking about is in the book of Revelation. It's a difficult book to understand because there's lots of symbolism. But there's a lot of stuff we can learn from it nevertheless. Do you want to know about the attempt to set up a one world government? It's in there. Do you want to know about the wars between the nation? I'm talking about global wars. It's in there. Do you want to know about the great religious persecution that's going to be going on during the tribulation period? It's in there. Do you want to know about miraculous signs that people are going to witness, both by the good guys and the bad guys? It's in there. It's in the book. Do you want to know about the war between the forces of good and evil? And now I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about actual angels and demons and, and the Antichrist and the beast and all of that kind of stuff. It's in there. Do you want to know the outcome of the war? It's in there. Do you want to know what eternity is like for the saved and the unsaved? 
it's in there. It's all in there. God's Word, the Bible, is an amazing book. It gives us hope to live our days lightly in our country, which right now I would argue has, is in and has been for, I think, almost three decades now in a great moral crisis. Somehow, that's going to have to turn around, or the, United Na or the United States, amongst all the nations, is going to fall. It must. Look at your history. No nation that comes totally, becomes almost totally corrupt can ever survive. The Bible says that God causes the nations to rise and to fall. And if you look at your history, even God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, he said, these are my people, my chosen nation. They're a special nation. They're above every other nation that I've created and that there ever will be. And he sent them into captivity several times in their history. We dare not be so arrogant as Americans to think that we're an exception to that rule. The Bible is an amazing book. It tells us how God's word has the power to create. It tells us that God wants to bless his people. It demonstrates the healing power of his word. It's the living and active power that it speaks to us and it changes us. It's the source of our protection from Satan and his demons. It tells us that God has given us the authority to bind and to loose. It tells us the few, what the future is going to be when there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. You know, one of the things that sometimes people ask is, well, when they think about the evil and suffering in the world, they say, well, why didn't God just create a world where there wasn't evil and suffering? It's a good question. But the answer is simple. He did. Read Genesis. Until Adam and Eve sinned, it was paradise. There was no evil. There was no suffering. There was no disease. There was no war. There was no need for funeral services. There was no need to go to cemeteries and bury people. None of that. But we, they say you got to deal with the cards that you're dealt. So we have evil and suffering in our lives, people around us that we love. But the good news is God started with paradise, and he's going to end with paradise, it tells us in Revelation. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And all of the stuff that's wrong with life on this earth isn't going to exist anymore. Scripture says there'll be no more crying, no more tears, no more wars, no more rumors of wars. Think of it. It's hard to imagine. God started with paradise, and he's going to end someday in paradise. All these things that we talked about that the Bible can do and tell us about, there's no other book in the world that can do any, not a single one of those other things. But the Bible can do it because it's God's word, and God's word is truth. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 96, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow, so if you'll please stand.
as we bow our heads for the benediction, I remind you of the Board of Christian Ed meeting downstairs after service. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your word. We especially are thankful that it's true, it's reliable, it's trustworthy. And because of that, we can claim the promises that are made there. Thank you for your love and for your word. Amen. Thank you.